And tonight, insha'Allah, we're going to talk about the signs of the hour. And this talk will be related to the current events, insha'Allah. I want to give some advice and hopefully there will be some direction, understanding, hope. And insha'Allah, I want you to feel that no matter what happens to a believer, what happens in this world, there is never a Muslim in the world who should ever give up hope. No person who wants goodness and justice should ever give up hope, whether in life or in death. And know that this life is nothing but a test. And shortly everyone will pass it, the good and the bad, the oppressor and the victim. We're all going to die eventually. And for a believer, victory is both in life and death because victory for a believer, success is in here, in their heart and in their mind, and in the cause that they stand up to. And the Prophet wasallam said that jihad is of many different levels, and the highest of them is a truthful word in front of a tyrant oppressor. My brothers and sisters, today in the Euro News, they interviewed an Israeli soldier, an Israeli citizen woman, I call it the occupied Palestine. But just for identity purposes, we'll say Israel, so you know who I'm talking about. And the Israeli soldier is packing his bag saying, this is now a fight between good and bad, good and evil. The Israeli woman says the only innocent people in Gaza right now are the hostages, the Israeli hostages. Once they're out, everybody can be wiped out. Everybody can be killed. She's talking about the babies, the children, the innocent women and men, the civilians. All of them are just evil, worse than the shaitan to them. And she said, we are now the center of the world, meaning the whole world revolves around them. They are the kings and the lords of the world. This is exactly what Fir'aun said when he enslaved the children of Israel, whom they claim are their ancestors, even though they are not their ancestors. Only some of them, and there are others who have nothing to do with those who are in Israel, nothing to do with the Zionists. There are many different people, even of different religions, even among the Muslims who are from the children of Israel. They were dispersed and they got mixed, and now it's just a mixed salad. It's gone. But now it's about righteousness, justice, and oppression. Al-haqq wal batil the truth and falsehood, justice and injustice. And... Uh, I just had a brother over here who's got family, he was just talking to me, who got family in Gaza. He told me that right now they block them off from every direction. Only a few ambulances are allowed to get in, and only those who are holding dual citizenships are allowed out. The rest of them are left there to be massacred. It is a genocide. It is a genocide. And uh, they're being bombarded now from the sea. Some of them have chosen to stay. Even if the borders were open, they choose not to leave. Some of the Muslim Gazans in there. Maybe even some of the Christians. They've chosen, this is our fate. We will die here if they kill us. Khalas. They've got nothing else to lose. They want to die with their dignity, with their deen, and with their honor. They don't see this world as anything. The hereafter is their paradise. So glad tidings to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those of them who have passed away and been killed. Fi sabilillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their children intercessors for them and waiting for them on the doors in Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them victory against their enemy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep them steadfast and give them patience and perseverance. May Allah protect them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them safety. My brothers and sisters, we now are the ones who should make du'a for ourselves. They're making du'a for us. And I quote the ayah in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 1,400 years ago A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Latubalawunna fi amwalikum wa anfusikum wa latasma'unna minal ladhina utu al-kitaba min قبلكم ومن الذين أشركوا أذى كثيرا وإن تصبروا وتتقوا 
واتقوا فإن ذلك من عزم الأمور In Surah Ali Imran verse 186 Allah says O believers you will certainly be put to test in respect of your properties and your lives and you will certainly hear many hurtful things from those who were granted the book before you and those who have associated others with Allah in his divinity if you remain patient and God fearing this indeed is a matter of great resolution brothers and sisters victory there is victory and there is success and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever is saved from evil and in the hereafter is saved from the fire and enters paradise, faqad faz. That is the true success. This life is but a test and exam. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Al-Ankabut, Alif Lam Mim Ahasiban Brothers and Allah says do people think that we will be let do people think that they will be let to go merely by saying we believe and that they will not be tested for we indeed tested those who went before them Allah will most certainly ascertain those who spoke the truth and those who lied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through conflict sometimes, through hardships, through loss of wealth, loss of lives, fear. Sometimes we lose a little bit of wealth. Sometimes we have certain sicknesses. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is how to sift between who is righteous and who is not, who is patient and who is not, who deserves and who doesn't deserve the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, مِنْكُمْ مَا يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَا يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ Some of you want this dunya, this temporary enjoying world, and others they want the akhirah. Brothers and sisters, but having said this, a Muslim does not give up. There is still hope, there is still a future, there is still things that are going to change. Nothing ever stays the same. The oppressor doesn't last very long. If for those of you who read about history and you educate yourselves and you learn about the history of civilization, you will know how no oppressive civilization stayed. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he repeats history. And there are those who stay and others who replace them. Certainly, the Zionists today and the uh, people who support this oppression, of course, not all Jews are like this, brothers and sisters, not all Christians, not all non-Muslims, not all people of the world who uh, you know, support all of this oppression. And I'm going to quote something marvelous, inshallah. However, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that every century, every 100 years, at the beginning of every century, Allah will send to this ummah, to this nation, someone who will reform them, a reformer. The hadith is in Abi Dawood and other hadith similar to that. What is this reformer? This is hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that every 100 years, uh, an enlightenment, a new beginning, a reformation will be sent to this world, especially to the nation, the ummah of the Muslims. Allahu a'lam in what way this reformer will come. Is it a human being? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it a movement? Is it a group? Or is it something else? Is it an event? The point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every century does not leave the world it, the way it is. And whatever is unjust, it will calibrate. Perhaps what is happening now, even though, brothers and sisters, atrocities and oppression are actually everywhere in the world happening every day. There isn't a place except that we do not, you know, except that we don't see it in the media as clear and as widespread as what we're seeing now in Palestine. But they are happening all the time. Atrocities, genocides, apartheid, uh, ethnic cleansings are happening everywhere. Especially where there are 
a you know, Muslim population, even non-Muslim population. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave the world the way it is. It always calibrates it. Every century, every 100 years. Perhaps this is the awareness, Allahu A'lam. Recently, in a new survey poll that was conducted by CNN via the SSRS. It's an independent research company and tool by Microsoft. And basically, they published on October the 12th, or th and th from 12 to 13th October 2023, a survey asking American people whether they supported Israel's recent actions in Gaza. And surprisingly, the results showed the following, that most young people of this generation, between the ages of 18 and 34 years old, they said that we do not support Israel's attacks on Gaza. And only 27% said it was fully justified. Only 27% of the young generation in America. The rest of them, 73% said we do not support Israel's attacks on Gaza. Whereas the majority of the older generation supported it, and said it was fully to partially justified. 81% of people over the age of 65, and about 50% on average between the ages of 35 to 64 years old. And what does this show, brothers and sisters? It shows, number one, that there is an awareness like no other time before, at least in the past 100 years, at least in the past 75 years of the occupation of Palestine. Number two, there is a transparency that is shown probably through social media that has never been as clear and transparent as before. I think you will agree with me. Number three, a new generation more open to other perspectives that is arising than the generations before. Number four, I see that human values and some morality is coming back, or at least there is an opening to accept a new morality, a new world for a new civilization, a new culture is, inshallah, going to come. So we are living in a time when a people are open to this new civilization and culture, inshallah ta'ala. And we are also living at a time of great fitna, trials and tribula tribulations and tests of our faith, our values, and our morals. What is happening now in Palestine, brothers and sisters, no matter how bad it looks, it is a stepping stone to something else. Mark my words. And the Prophet ﷺ told us 1,400 years ago that the signs of the last hour will appear in the following way. He gave us a visual example. What was it? He said they are like the stones inside of a bead. Or the beads, sorry, inside of a string. You know the beads? It's got little stones in it. If you cut the string, the beads start coming out, but the next bead won't come out until the first bead comes out. So one bead comes out, the next one follows, the third one follows, the fourth one follows. But the fourth and the fifth won't follow until the one before it comes out. So he said the signs of the last hour will come the signs of the last hour will come one by one like the way the beads come out of a string. What does that mean? It means that what you're seeing right now, you're going to say, in fact in the hadith it also says this, Rasulullah did say, everyone will say, this is it, this is it, this is it. This is the end. This is the one. Whatever it is. But it's merely another bead that is opening the way to another sign that is bigger than that and another sign that is bigger than that until things are calibrated. So this is a stepping stone to something else, the inevitable that will come. Whether the entire Palestine is taken over by the Israelis and it's called the state of Israel altogether, whether they build the temple of Solomon, whether all the Jews of the world come and live in it, where all the Palestinians are exiled out of it, whatever is, can, all of this can happen, brothers and sisters. All of this can happen. Right now there is nothing in the Quran or Sunnah that we know of or the scholars know of. Is it all good, Akhi Hadram? All right. Sorry, it's a good friend of mine. 
All good? I thought you'd be. Brothers and sisters, what, what am I saying? Everything, uh -huh. there's nothing that the scholars have indicated right now that is anything major except what we are seeing. But they are a stepping stone to something else. So the inevitable is coming. The inevitable is coming. Brothers and sisters, in the past, Allah SWT gives us examples of great civilizations and empires that reached great heights, meaning in their arrogance. Their arrogance reached heights and there to the point where Pharaoh says, I don't know any other God but me among you. Isn't that true? وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Allah says, and such are the ways that we replace days in in exchange for other days. Yeah, and new generations come, new empires come, new powers replace other powers. Nothing ever stays. But right now, Allah is sifting through and testing everyone because in times of conflict, everyone's stance is known. Everyone's faith and belief is known and a new pathway opens up. A new pathway. My brothers and sisters, at the moment, at the moment, I can count about nine things that we as Muslims can do. You might, not, you might not agree with all of them. Maybe some of them work. Maybe some of them don't. Maybe some of them are better than others. Some of them are mixed with maybe it's allowed, maybe not allowed, maybe permissible, maybe not permissible. But these are the nine things that we, inshallah, can make our intention for the sake of Allah and do them while we are living here in Australia and are safe, alhamdulillah. Number one, this is an opportunity for the heart to be renewed. Our faith is being renewed whether we like it or not. We can't help it. We switch off social media, our hearts are still pumping, thinking. And some people I know, they're going through some mental distress. Today a brother asked me, my wife is going through mental distress and anxiety and she can't cope. I said to him, it's okay brother, switch off social media. She doesn't have to look at everything. You don't have to look at the atrocities to make yourself feel better about yourself they're doing something good brothers and sisters sometimes you don't you, you have to still save your mental state and i know some people will say oh they're all dying and you're worried about your mental state no no don't believe those statements al-mu'min al-qawi khayru min al-mu'min al-da'if rasulullah told us a strong believer is more beneficial than a weak believer you don't want to destroy yourselves with there is still future coming there's still generations coming we've still got our children the heart number two the identity it's a time to renew our identity. At school at the moment, we got children to write letters. We told them, write letters to the children of Gaza. And I said, I'm going to try my best to send them through a charity organization to get them to, this, to those kids and take photos. Allahu alam, 90% chance I'm not going to be able to. But what are we doing? We're letting those, this young generation know their identity, know their culture, know who they are know that they are connected to all their brothers and sisters around the world. This is called an ummah. And nobody can beat an ummah that is together, brothers and sisters. Nobody. This new generation, our children, are the next ones, inshallah. And we need to plant into them their identity once again. Who are they? Number four, uh, number three, dua. A lot of people are making dua with the wrong intention. They're saying, oh, we're making dua, but nothing's changing. Who told you that dua is only about things changing? Dua is worship. Dua is connection with Allah. Dua is renewing who, your faith and your connection as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what should change and what, should, what shouldn't. But when you make dua, you are connecting yourself individually to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering who you are, remembering why you're here. Someone said, you know, what's two billion uh, dua is going to do? Two billion dua is two billion people reconnecting what they lost with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the future will look better with that because the inner self has to be renewed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta, hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the state of a people until they change the state that is within themselves. Anfusihim means your inner self and your inner communities. There are still hypocrites among the communities. There are still people who um, are in power that don't care. If Allah were to give these people right now the victory, perhaps the next day we'll be killing each other. Maybe we're not ready, brothers and sisters. Allah will not entrust the people with an authority and power if He knows they will corrupt it, if the situation will be worse. Sometimes Allah will not give you exactly what you want because we don't know what the future holds. 
We don't know what kind of people will take control. We don't know how the ummah will be if Allah were to give us power now in the way that we want it. Allah knows. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give nasr and victory, but in the right way. Not in the way that we want, not in the current state that we are in. Allah will not give it to a people who are not ready to exercise it. On an individual level, maybe there's many, alhamdulillah, and will always be. But there needs to be a collective reformation. A collective reformation. You can only do your little part. Number six, or number five, sharing what is happening there. If you are able to share statements on what is happening there, share them. I believe that it is creating a larger awareness, and that's the result of why the world is seeing what they're seeing, and the shift is happening. Number six, education. Talk to your knowledgeable intellectuals at your school. You see a Muslim intellectual who knows a lot about history and politics, ask them, say, sir, miss, can you teach me a little bit? If you're at university, ask an intellectual who knows about um, history and, and uh, politics and how the world works. Educate yourselves. Uh, we have, sometimes we do uh, at school what we call... Um, uh, interfaith dialogues. I know the word interfaith to some people means something else, but what we do it is we talk to them about Islam, they talk to us about their religion, we ask questions, and we engage in teaching them, and we learn about their ways. Alhamdulillah, our students always come out of it, learning and appreciating their deen even more. Sometimes we had Jewish schools, which we used to meet together at our school, and we realized that in their schools, from grade prep all the way to year 12, they teach them the most strongest curriculum about Jewish history. Everything about Palestine and Israel, everything about the, 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 the history of the Jews and Israelites and so on and so forth. And so their identity or their, whatever they've taught them is enshrined in them. So we need education. Number seven, some people ask me, what about boycotting? I say to you, brothers and sisters, boycotting for those who study finance Boycotting works, but it has to be on a major level. If you want to ask me materialistically, I'll give you the answer. But then I'm going to tell you boycotting individually. Boycotting on a large scale works. How? When a government, when a government says all the shops and products in our country will now be closed. They don't allow them. On that level... Boycotting works. Unfortunately, we don't have that. So let's look at the individual. No one has the right to tell everybody, you know, it's haram to eat this or that. But what I can tell you is this. I'm not a mufti. I can't impose this on you. But me personally, I feel sick to my stomach if I buy or eat any product that is helping the economy currently of the Israeli army against the innocents in Gaza. I feel sick to my stomach. And I believe everyone should feel sick that way as well. Maybe it may affect, may not. Uh, I don't believe all the social media statistics that the people send around. I, I, don't, you know, I, I don't like disinformation and I don't follow things that I cannot confirm. However, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least I can say, Ya Rabb, I did something within my little power. Allah doesn't look at the outcome. He's looking at the process. What do you do with it? The outcome is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as there are alternatives, until there's no alternatives, I'll tell you bye. That's okay. But we have alternatives, alhamdulillah. We have alternatives. So long as you have alternatives and you're eating and you're drinking, alhamdulillah, you don't need that other product. So just as an individual with you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number eight, people ask me about protests and rallies. Normally, I don't like protests, and I've stopped protests since 2001, since, since September 11. We've done many protests before for Palestine, all that, and I've given up on them. Uh, I, I don't like them. I don't see them being any benefit. In fact, the haram is more than the good. However, what I've seen now, just in this case, there has been some benefit in rallies and protests, and I understand there's some haram in there with the free mixing, and I don't know what. Last week, I did, uh, we did a, uh, a khutbah, in the Flagstar Gardens, alhamdulillah. I was the khatib there, and it was about 5,000 or so people. And I saw the, 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 the article in the age, alhamdulillah. Wallahi, I found it such an effective gathering because I called it the stormy silence. See all the shouting and the screaming that people do when they walk in the streets? Just that gathering together, 
silently doing salat and listening to the khutbah and seeing how we're all gathered in silence was extremely stormy. And a lot of non-Muslims came around and they listened. And they could able to listen and hear through the stormy silence. These types, I think, work better. And Allah knows best. And lastly, writing to MPs and ministers. A lot of people I heard say, why should you write to the kuffar? See this mentality, brothers and sisters? I don't agree with it. Rather, I say to you, don't take... Yani, you've got to understand the Qur'an properly. And you've got to look at the reality around you and start to become creative and innovative in your mind, O Muslims. Stop this narrow-mindedness. When seeking, when Rasul went into battle and the kuffar wanted to come in to help him, he said, we don't need you because they were already organized, they were innovative, they were creative, they had planned. Rasul Sallallahu got even some of the sahabas to go and learn the languages of some of the enemies, like the Persian language, education. They were taking ideas from the disbelievers that they lived amongst. They were taking ideas from the Persians. And today here in Australia, if we can make a small shift by lobbying our government and writing to the ministers and the MPs, maybe that small shift can happen. Something that benefits the Muslims and so we can say to Allah, Ya Rabbi, we use what we can in power. Whatever we can. We're not saying the kuffar are going to change everything. We don't know what their hearts are like. But why not use all the resources that Allah gave us? In fact, the Rasul Sallallahu did say towards the end of time, تُصَالِحُونَ الرُّوم The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. You will have a peaceful pact and allegiance together with the Romans. In those days, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi called them Romans. Today, Allahu A'lam with the Romans are, but they are the descendants. You can say the Europeans, probably the British, maybe the Americans, maybe Australia, maybe... You know, all those types of people who their origins were from what used to be called the Byzantines or the Romans. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, you will have a peaceful pact with them together to fight a common enemy of yours. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It hasn't happened yet, but that's towards the end of time before the Mahdi comes out. Before the Mahdi comes out, as, uh, as what the scholars said. And before Isa Alayhi Salam and before the Dajjal. We all know who I'm talking about. We're Muslims. That you will have a pact with them. So brothers and sisters, using that to our advantage is good. Let's not restrict our minds and think outside of the box for, for, for a change. We need to be creative and read more. And there are two books which I uh, advise my brothers and sisters to read. One of them, what is one of them called? I'll tell you which books to read, brothers and sisters. These are really good books, inshallah. One of them is called uh, The Clash of civilizations the clash of civilizations uh, by S. Huntington and also another book to read uh, by Al-Adawi Sheikh Al-Adawi he's passed away now which was written in the 1950s what did the world lose by the decline of Islamic civilization ماذا خسر العالم what did the world lose by the decline of Islamic civilization? Excellent book to read. Please read it and learn very well. You'll understand the entire world and especially how we reference it to the Quran. My brothers and sisters, a Jewish man asked me, why do you people wish Israel evil? The other day he said to me, why do you wish Israel evil? And I found that question extremely strange that it's even being asked. Who said we wish Israel or Jews evil? Yani, under Islamic rule, under the Muslim rule, we, our Islamic empire, is known in history to be the only, only empire who ever gave the rights and peace to both Jews and Christians and other people of different religions in, under the Islamic rule, in Palestine, in Jerusalem, and everywhere else. It's strange. Rasul Sallallahu said, for example, whoever wrongs a mu'ahid, a non-Muslim living under Muslim rule, whoever harms them or wrongs them, detracts from him or takes from his rights, or burdens him or her with more work than he is able to do, takes something from him without his consent, I will plead for him. 
Rasul Sallallahu said, I will plead for him, the non-Muslim, or I will be the opponent of the Muslim who wronged him on the day of resurrection. The hadith is in Abu Dawood. Uh, in Germany, the Jews were confined to concentration camps. The Germans under Hitler even massacred hundreds of thousands of them in gas chambers. But ironically, the descendants of those victims of the Holocaust now subject the Palestinian, Arabs, Christians and Muslims alike to ghettos and other grave oppressions just like what happened to them. And this person asked, why do you... In Christian West unjust, the Christian West unjustly relegated the Jewish people as a whole for something their ancestors did to the ghettos of Western cities. Palestinians, Palestinians are the only people, these poor Palestinians, the only people who did not take part in World War I and World War II. They're the only people who did nothing of violence, who welcomed the Jewish people from around the world to come back. And of course, there were some already in Palestine welcomed them and lived with them in harmony. And they're the only ones who they persecute now as if they are the ones who caused these harm to them. In pre-1917, 1948, Jews, Christians and Muslims lived harmoniously and peacefully, neighbor to neighbor, face to face. Everybody worshipped and was happy for centuries in Palestine. Post-1948, however, Israel uprooted the Palestinians, killed them, massacred them, destroyed them, persecuted them, made an apartheid, did ethnic cleansing, threw them out of their homes, stole their homes, stole their lands, caused them to be in Gaza in an open prison before, before Hamas came out, even before, for 75 years. And now a genocide is happening, ethnic cleansing in every name of the word, against all international law, against the UN resolutions. And, then the, and this person asks me, why do you guys hate Israel or want evil on Israel? SubhanAllah, we don't want evil on Israel. We don't want evil on Jews. We don't want evil on Christians. Islam doesn't want evil on anybody. We want goodness for everybody. Rahmatan lil alameen. Allah sent Muhammad as a mercy to mankind. Give us a chance to help you and advise you. To, we want you to be guided to the Islam but not through violence. However, with all this, a person asks me, why do you want evil? We hate injustice. We hate injustice. And Allah hates injustice. Ala kulli hal. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised in the Quran. He says in surah number 5, verse 54, O believers, يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبونهم ويحبونه أذلة على المؤمنين أعزة على الكافرين يجاهدون في سبيل الله يجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لومة لائم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله واسع عليم Stay with me now, I'm going to go into the signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Believers, if any of you should ever turn away from your faith, remember that Allah will raise, up to, will raise up a people whom He loves and who love Him, a people humble towards the believers and firm towards the unbelievers. Firm towards the unbelievers means those opposing Islam cannot dislodge his or her faith and Islamic values and morals. It means they are firm like a rock against those who try to influence them who will strive hard in the way of Allah and will not fear the reproach of the reproacher. This is the favor of Allah which he grants to whom he wills. Allah is vast in resources all-knowing. What does this mean? It means that no matter what calamity befalls you, O Muslims, never give up or despair and think bad about your creator and leave your deen. If you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at this generation. He will say, okay, the next generation. If not that generation, the one after them. He will replace them. Those who love him and he loves them. So don't ever... Think that it's over, brothers and sisters. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, in the hadith which is in Al-Bukhari, he said, 
If the final hour comes while you have a shoot of a plant of a palm tree, a little seedling or a shoot of a palm tree, in your hands, and it is in your power to plant it before the hour comes, you should plant it. What does the hadith mean? It means even if you heard the hour has come and the world's going to end, you are able to do even a tiny good deed, continue to do the good deed. Don't just sit there and say, well, there's no point. There is always a point. The outcome is for Allah and the good work is for you. Even the last breath, do a good deed. Continue to do even if it's something small. Whatever you can do. As for the outcome, is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for Al-Quds, which is called the holy sacred place. Al-Quds, Jerusalem, Palestine and its surrounding. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that there will always be a migration to Al-Quds, nation after nation, generations after generations, and migration to that place of the believers will never ever stop until the end of time. What does this hadith Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Which is in Abu Dawood and others. He is saying, never despair or give up hope. Al-Quds has been destined by Allah from the beginning of time till the end of this world that even if, it's, even if the believers or the people ruling in justice are out of it, they will come back again and again and again. And people will migrate and the migration will intensify until you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and in the Quranic verses, you can read a book for uh, Imam uh, Al Maududi, for example, in the Tafsir or others, they'll tell you because they're in English, they'll tell you that all the verses of the Quran that talk about it and the hadith, which talk about the, the migration to Al Aqsa, to Al Quds, means that inevitably Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return the righteous people to it who uphold the Quran. Because it's the final revelation, it came at the end of the Torah, the Injil and the Zams and all the scriptures of Abraham, Moses and Jesus, السلام, and the Quran is the final one to reconfirm the corrupted scriptures and what was lost. The Quran is the final word of Allah that will uphold it and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, which will end with Isa السلام, and the Mahdi the Khalifa, the believers will return back to it. And this is something which even the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews today refer to in the Torah. They say that we are awaiting the Messiah. So there's something in common, and I'll come back to it, inshallah. Ibn Rajab says, This is the end of times as a foretold good news by the Prophet Wasallam that the most righteous among the believers will eventually flock and gather there to Al-Quds and around meaning Asham, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, those areas, a bit of Turkey, and around, extending from it as a final place for the righteous before the world ends. So, there is still to come. The scholar said, this and other hadiths, including verses in Surah Al-Isra, are very strong indications that the Khalifa, the Caliphate, will return, and it is the headquarters it will be the headquarters where in Palestine and the capital city will be Jerusalem for the Khalifa. The hadith called it Asham. And remember, Asham means Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, bits of uh, Turkey and Syria. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked about five leaderships that will happen from his time until the end of time. Let's look at these five leaderships. The hadith is in Musnad Ahmad and in the Mishkat al-Masabih and other books of hadith. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Prophethood shall remain among you as long as God wills. That's already happened. Prophethood was among us until Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death. Then, al khilaf al-Rashida, the rightly guided Khalifa on the pattern of prophethood will commence and remain as long as Allah wills. That second leadership has now ended. The Khilaf al Rashid, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and a few after him until Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, as the scholars said. Then what will happen, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Then a corrupt monarchy shall then follow, and it shall remain as long as God wills. This monarchy is in the way of Khilafah as well. The caliphate system afterwards, the Abbasid and the Umayyad and the Ottoman Empire, came after that. Unfortunately, it turned into somewhat of a dynasty. 
So it's like a monarchy where, you know, when a king is in rule, they only allow the prince and people within the family to take the leadership after them. So the Khilafah becomes similar to a monarchy, a dynasty. Rasul Sallallahu says, what, what's next? That's the third one. The fourth one he says, then there shall be a ty- tyrannical despotism, meaning a tyrannical dictatorship of some sort, which shall remain as long as God wills. And the ulama say, we are in that now. Now we are in a tyrannical rule. What happens next, Ya Rasulullah? He said, then, once again, the Khilafah will emerge on the precept of the original prophethood. It will return to the way it was at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Supporting this verse is in the Quran. Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا وَمَنْ كَفَرَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Allah has promised those who are among you who believe and act righteously that He will surely make them successes as Khalifas in the earth as He made successes for them for, as He made successes from among those who were before them and that he will surely establish for them their religion, which he has chosen for them, and that he will surely grant them security and peace in place of their fear, which they went through. This, How is this verse understood? It is understood, brothers and sisters, that inshallah soon, as people like the Pharaoh, as people like the Romans before, as people like the Persians before, all of those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exchanged their power, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also exchanged this ummah and bring back the khilafah of people who will act in righteousness. My dear brothers and sisters, the scholars such as Zamakhshari and Shawkani ibn Kathir said, this verse means that Allah has promised a continuation of a successive ruling under the caliph system for the believers who believed in the final book of Allah, the Quran, and his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That just like Allah made nations before the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inherit leadership from other great rulers and empires, Allah will never leave this ummah for, for long without it returning to leadership as a nation on earth, meaning successive caliphate that will always return and continues till the last hour. Rasul Sallallahu said, The Romans will enter into a peace treaty with you. Then you and they will fight one another as enemies, and you will be victorious. You will collect the spoils of war and be safe. Then you will come back until you stop in a meadow with many hillocks. A man from among the people of the cross will raise the cross and will say, The cross has prevailed. Then a man among the Muslims will become angry and will go and break the cross. Obviously, this is not a right thing to do, but that's what will happen. Rasul Sallallahu said it will happen. Then the Romans will prove treacherous, breaking the treaty, and will gather for a fierce battle. This has not happened yet, but is yet to come. In another instance, Rasul Sallallahu said, which is in Sahih Muslim, then the Romans will come and have a fierce battle with you that is so intense, so intense, that you will see the flying object falling from the sky. Allahu A'lam, what kind of battle that is. And a group of them will rush from Medina to help their brothers. And a group of those Romans will meet them at a certain place near Asham. And they will say to them, we are not here to fight you. We are going to grab those who have run away from the Muslim army. Run away meaning they're going to regroup. And those Muslim from Medina, they will say, Wallahi, we will not let you go to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Rasul said, a third of them will run away. Allah will never forgive them. 
from the Muslims. A third of them will die, they are the best martyrs on that day, and a third of them will be victorious. Jannah is for them and no harm will ever affect them. And then they will fall, then they will take Constantinople and it will fall in peace, peacefully. Then the Dajjal will emerge. The Muslims will go back and find that it's false news. And then after a few days, the Dajjal truly has come out. And then Isa alayhi salam, the true Messiah, Jesus the Christ, will descend a little after. What is Constantinople? What is the Prophet ﷺ meaning in that? Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. What are the details of this? Allah knows best, but that is yet to come. But it indicates, brothers and sisters, as the scholars said, that Al-Mahdi, Al-Mahdi, which means the rightly guided leader that is yet to emerge, may or may not be leading yet at that time. But it could be the general, but there could be a general or a commander or a sultan-like person who will lead the Muslims, insha'Allah, who fights with the Romans, etc., or could be the Mahdi as the Khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As for Jerusalem, Al-Mahdi, let's talk a little bit about him. It is in the Sunni belief, I'm going to quote to you the Sunni belief, because there are other beliefs about Al-Mahdi. No authentic hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim about Al-Mahdi specifically, but there is an indication. The rest of the hadiths are dispersed throughout the other books of hadith, and they are called mutawatir, which means that they have come from different angles of narrations, which means the scholars accept them as authentic, all of them. Some of them are weak and some of them are made up. But here are the ones that are authentic, inshallah. That al-Mahdi means the guided one. His name is Muhammad, son of Abdullah. His father's name is Abdullah. His name is the same name as Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said his name is like my name, and his father's name is like my father's name. From the Prophet's direct lineage, he is from the lineage of Fatima radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu anhu. And he will emerge towards the end of time. He will fill the world with justice, just as it was filled with injustice and depression. And he will rule as the Khalifa for seven years or eight years, according to different narrations of hadiths, at seven or eight years. Within that time, he will change the oppression and corruption in the world, especially in the Middle East, from what it is now to become so just and equitable for all people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And Rasul said, he will rule as Khalifa for seven to eight years, and there will be lots of vegetation that will grow and plant growth. Wealth will increase, meaning there will be economic stability, and there will be economic equality. There will be no poor people anymore. Wealth will increase and blessings will flourish. And the Prophet ﷺ described him, uh, there's so much description, he said, he will have a wide forehead and a thin nose. And he will break the cross and kill the pig and abolish the jizya, the tax system, because there will be no more poor people enough to receive it. Meaning non-Muslims will no longer pay the tax because there will be no more poor people to receive it. And the Muslim empire will no longer need any economic help. So no more need for the jizya, even from the non-Muslims. Brothers and sisters, there's, this, there's a lot of packed information there. Al-Mahdi will break the cross. What does that mean? It doesn't mean literally that he breaks the cross. Because there are thousands and millions of crosses. Will he break every single cross? No. The correct opinion among the scholars is that he will abolish the ancient idea of the Trinity and that Jesus is the Son of God, which is based on the symbol of the cross. The whole idea of the cross is that the Son of God was sent down, who is Jesus Christ, to die for our sin and our atonement, and that he died for our sins, and that the original sin, according to the Catholic religion and others, that the original sin uh, is something which Jesus Christ came to take care of, and then he was resurrected, and so on and so forth, and all of that. That idea, that concept, and that belief will be destroyed. How? the majority of Christians, according to the hadiths, will actually repent and follow Isa alayhi salam under the Islam and under the Qur'an and Sunnah, insha'Allah. And then what happens? It says that Al-Mahdi will be running away. He won't know that he's the Mahdi. From a place in the east, some hadiths say he will end up in Medina, and from Medina he will run to Mecca. He will not know that he's the Mahdi. He will not know. And he will arrive in Mecca, an army will be following him, also from the east, and they want to kill him, and the earth will swallow them up, or something will happen to them. 
The ulama will look around in Mecca at him and will know that he is the appointed Mahdi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make him righteous and prepared in a very short time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not waste, yani there will not be much time wasted. And he will be the leader, Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in many authentic hadiths, he is your Khalifa. He will be your Khalifa. Now, of course, it doesn't mean there will be no Khalifa before him or a leader. Some Muslims, they wait and they say, until the Mahdi comes and they sit doing nothing. Brothers and sisters, this is weak and this is laziness and this is giving in to miraculous divinity. A Muslim does not think like that. We don't sit there waiting for God to take care of things. No, you have to do your part. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell you to wait for the Mahdi. And Mahdi is not even mentioned in the Quran. The Dajjal is not mentioned in the Quran. And the scholars... Who, are, who I asked about this, big scholars, major scholars, they told me the reason it's not mentioned in the Quran is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to focus on it. The ummah should not focus on waiting for the Mahdi and waiting for the Dajjal and Isa alayhi salam. Because the Quran addresses what we need to do now universally. And right now, forget about the Mahdi, forget about Isa alayhi salam, forget about the Dajjal. Yes, we are living in a time which is Dajjal. In an, adjective, the, the, in an adjective word, meaning that we are living in a time of false influence and lies. We don't, it's confusion. That's called Dajjal, but not, it's not the Dajjal. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا نَزَلَ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ فِيكُمْ وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ Oh, how your state will be when the son of Maryam, Isa alayhi salam, the Messiah, Jesus son of Mary, will descend upon you, and while your imam, your leader will be among you. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And the scholar said your imam means your khalifa. It could be al-Mahdi or someone else, but according to the hadith, it is al-Mahdi. In Sahih Muslim, it says that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ. Some people said, why do you say Christ? Well, you know, you have your opinion. Some people have their opinion and all that stuff. I'm not going to go into that, but he is Christ. He is al-Masih. It's translated as Masih loosely. And he is Isa alayhi salam, son of Maryam. Al-Masih ibn Maryam, Prophet ﷺ said, will descend and appear at the white minaret east of Damascus, fi Dimashq, or Jordan, meaning Palestine those days. Those days meant Palestine. With his hands on top of wings of two angels, when he drops his head, uh, water sprinkles off his hair, and when he lifts his head, pearl-like droplets scatter from his hair. They look like pearls. In Bukhari it says, the hour will not come until the Messiah, son of Mary, will come. He will break the cross and kill the pig and fill the world with justice just as it was filled with oppression. Killing the pig, Allahu A'lam, what that means. It doesn't mean literally every pig he sees, he kills the pig. Not the animal. Allahu A'lam, what it is, it could mean corruption, filth, immorality. He breaks and kills immorality and filth. Allah knows best what that means. But whatever it is, He returns people back to morality, back to true values, because that has degenerated in this world today, even in our ummah, among our youth, among all of us. We are affected by the Western immoralities and Western bad values. Right now, they, they, their family system is broken apart. The values and morals are broken apart. And perhaps that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not yet give and entrust this ummah with this, because maybe we'll corrupt the trust that He gives us. Allahu A'lam. When Isa salam emerges and the Dajjal arrives, the fight will happen at Jerusalem with Al-Mahdi leading the army of the believers. In Sahih Muslim, uh, Hadith 2922, Rasul salam said, The hour will not begin until the Muslims fight the Jews, and the Muslims will kill them until a Jew hides behind a rock or a tree, and the rock or tree will say, O Muslim, O slave of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Except the Gharqad, which means a thorny type of tree, for it is one of the trees of the Jews, it will not speak. When does this happen? Some Muslims, they believe that this is going to happen now, with the current Israel. No, it has nothing to do with today. Nothing. This happens when, this is towards the end of time, and here's something very interesting for you to know. This happens when Isa alayhi salam, the true Messiah, comes back. Jesus. When the Khalifa is established. When the Mahdi has returned. And when the Dajjal is on earth. What happens? The Dajjal who is 
in Christian tradition, he's called the Antichrist in the New Testament. We don't call him the Antichrist. We call him, as the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him, Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, the false Messiah. Why is he called the false Messiah? Because he will say to the people, I am the Messiah. Dajjal will say, I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, and I took this information, by the way, from a source called the Jewish Virtual Library. That's my source because, you know, obviously there are Jews who say you don't know our religion, so I just took it from there. Maybe I'm right or wrong. But what it says is this. There's something they believe in called the Messianic or Messianic Age. I don't know if I said that right. Basically, the Messianic Age, the Jews believe, is that the Messiah will come back. They are also waiting for the Messiah. And they are going to build the third temple because the first two temples were destroyed by the Romans before and by the Babylonians or the Assyrians, I'm not sure, back in you know, 2000 or something or 3000 years ago. I'm not sure exact, but a very long time ago. And the return to Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, the land of peace, or to the temple of Zion. And they say that there will be peace for all. Goodness and justice will be replaced. It's very similar to what our hadiths talk about, the Mahdi coming back and Isa filling the world with justice and peace. So they have this idea as well, as before. And there are many theories among their rabbis about what the sign is before the Messiah comes. The ultra-Orthodox Jews, I told you, they say we're not allowed to come into Israel. This is oppression according to the Torah. We're meant to be... Um, exiled and, and dispersed throughout the world. We're not allowed to go in until the Messiah comes and that's when we'll enter. Then you've got the Zionist beliefs and there are so many different types of Zionists, political, cultural, which is what Einstein was on. Cultural be- Zionist is probably the easiest one, I think. It's the one where they say we've got to live alongside the Palestinians in goodness and fairness and not, you know, and, 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 and not shed blood or something like that. And uh, there is also, uh, as I said, political Zionism, Christian Zionists as well. The Christian Zionists, they say... The Jews have to return back to their homeland and and make a state of Israel in order for the return of Jesus. So that's why they support it. This this is one sect of the Christian uh, Zionists. And so on. So it's very complicated. As for the Muslims, listen to what the Prophet ﷺ told us. And this is where I'll end it, inshallah. The full story, and objectively we're speaking, is this. From an Islamic perspective... In our books of hadith and sources, Isa, the true Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the son of Maryam, alayhi salam, Isa al-Masih, ibn Maryam, when he descends, he will enter the masjid in Jerusalem, in Palestine. What does that mean? It means that there will be no more Jews, or at least the authority of the Jews or Israel will no longer be there anymore, according to our sources. Towards the end of time, there will no longer be the authority. That the Khalifa will be in Palestine, that will be the headquarters, and that Jerusalem will be the capital, according to the context of the hadiths that I've read. And the Isa salam will enter the masjid, the mosque, possibly in Damascus, because in those days Palestine or Asham was all of that place. Uh, and he will see the imam, the leader of this nation. The scholar said he is most likely al-Mahdi. And he will say to him, so the, the Mahdi will, will move back as he's about to pray. I don't know which salat, maybe fajr, maybe dhuhr, Allahu alam. God knows. And he will say to Isa, the Messiah, to come and pray imam. And Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, will say to him, no, stay and you pray imam. For every nation, God has blessed it with their own leaders. And he will pray behind the Mahdi. Isa al-Masih, the Prophet he will pray behind the Mahdi and he will join the Ummah following the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasul also said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي By the one who possesses my soul in his hand. If Musa, Musa alayhi salam, was here with me today, he will not do anything except follow me. He will follow 
the Quran and my Sunnah because he's the last prophet. So Isa alayhi salam will also follow the Quran because the last revelation of Allah and the last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And he will say, you are the leader of this ummah. He doesn't come as the Khalifa, but as a guide in a different way. Then the Dajjal. The Dajjal is called the Antichrist in Islam, the false messiah, the lying messiah. His story is very long. Now, we don't know if a Dajjal is now living. I know that some people, they use the hadith, they say, what about the hadith in Sahih Muslim about, uh, what's his name, the, the Sahabi? Huh? What's his name? The one that went on an island and he saw the Jal and he saw the Jassasa, the beast. Someone remind me of his name? No one knows? Tamim al Dari. Tamim al Dari. The hadith in there is very long. It says that they went on an island and they saw a man that was tied up and the man says to them, oh, Tell me about Medina, tell me about this, tell me about the palm trees in, in, uh, in I don't know what. And, and he answered that, and then they said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, and al-Masih. Sorry, he didn't say Jesus. He says, I am al-Masih. I am the Messiah. And then they left. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say if he really is the Dajjal. That man could have been a normal man who claimed a lie. So there's no indication in any of the authentic hadiths that a Dajjal is really living. Another people quoted that there was a man by the name of um, what's his name who lived in Medina a man named uh, what was his name Safi ibn Sayyad again another hadith about Safi ibn Sayyad who the Sahabas thought he was the, he was the Dajjal and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam assumed he was and all that stuff but again Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not confirm he's the Dajjal so we don't know if the Dajjal is alive since then whether he's coming out what's his story the point is a false messiah will come out and say, I am the Messiah, but he is lying. After that, he will say, I am God. And the people will take him as a God. Now, let's look at the Jews' scriptures. They're saying the Messiah is coming. It makes sense now that if they follow him, because the Prophet wasallam, he says, the Dajjal will come from the east, and with him 70,000 Jews of Asfahan. Now, we don't know if it's the, literally from Asfahan or there or that they had gone out of uh, Israel and all that, and they'd become dispersed in the land. They all come back thinking he is the Messiah that they are waiting for. And the majority of his followers will be the Jews, according to our sources. And among them are Christians and Romans and others. And they will be heading towards where? Towards Jerusalem. Now, also makes sense if you look at their scriptures, which they say they are going to go back in with the Messiah to rebuild the third temple of Solomon, or the third temple, whatever they call it, on Zion. So they'll be coming with their Messiah, which we, in our sources, is the false Messiah. He is actually the Dajjal. Because it will show them signs. Allah subhanahu wa will give him certain powers that will make them believe that he is a God. They literally believe that he is a God. Allah knows best. A lot of Jews will disagree because they don't worship other gods beside Allah. But something will happen according to our religious sources, which make them believe that at least he's a partner to God. When he enters Jerusalem, he comes to Jerusalem, Isa alayhi salam, the, the, the true Messiah, will be with the Muslims, with the righteous people and the Mahdi, and he will say to the Mahdi, open the gate, the gate of Jerusalem, and the gate will be opened, and the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will be waiting behind the door, thinking that he's going to enter with his followers and his army, accompanied by an army of 70,000 Jews from the east, and he will be dressed, they will be dressed in robes of green color satin. Rasul sallallahu said, alayhim tayalisa There's two different interpretations. Either they are green colored satin robes, or it means a type of helmet. The hadith is a Sahih Muslim. As soon as the Dajjal sees Isa alayhi salam when he opens the door of Jerusalem, he runs away, and the hadith says that he starts to melt. I don't know how, but that's the hadith. We leave it at that. Isa alayhi salam runs after him. And he takes his sword out, or whatever weapon he has, and he kills the Dajjal. And the Dajjal bleeds. And then he lifts the sword, or whatever weapon he has, and shows the, his army and says, If he was God, will he bleed? And at that point... A lot of the Christians who were following, thinking he is Jesus the returning, they repent, 
and follow the true Messiah, Isa alayhi salam. And maybe some of the Jews do. I don't know. But I read some interpretations, but only Allah knows. I cannot confirm. The point is, after that, there will be years of peace, justice, goodness, repentance. Only Allah knows how long. Al-Mahdi will rule for seven to eight years, meaning he will die within that time. Some hadith said that it will be ten years for Isa al-Masih, Isa alayhi salam. Allah knows best. So what is it now, brothers and sisters? Right now, we are still in the bead, in, in a string of beads. Which bead are we on right now? That's happening right now. But mark my words, this bead will open the door to the next bead, the next event that will happen, and then the next event, and the next event. How do you stand right now? Where is your heart? Where is your iman? Are you going back to the values and morals of your deen? It has to be collective. If it's not collective, at least you do your part, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, establish your deen in your house as much as you can. Establish it within yourself as much as you can. Help your brothers and sisters wherever around the world. Every little bit of worry that you have right now, you are rewarded for it. You go to sleep, some of you have this little anxiety. Alhamdulillah. That shows that your iman is true. When you feel the flame for your brothers and sisters. That shows that alhamdulillah, the flame is inside of you. The flame of goodness. You have a heart, alhamdulillah, that is ready to be awakened. Or is already. So don't despair. وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ As Prophet Ya'qub, Jacob said, alayhi salam, Israel, he said to his children, وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Never despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His closeness to you. The only ones who despair from Allah's mercy and His closeness to them are the people who disbelieve in Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, my brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to that which is right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the innocent people around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine and all the Muslims around the world, the believers, wherever they are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change their state from, from evil to good, from hardship to ease, from insecurity to safety. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide those who are disbelievers and evil to goodness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deal with the disbelievers who are evil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide those among the Muslims who have hypocrisy in their hearts. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace the hypocrites with the righteous ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a, allow us to see the right in the right and the evil as evil. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clear our hearts and open our sight and unite us as one body. Ameen. Allahumma. ارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم اغفر لهم ولنا اللهم اغفر لنا ما قصرنا وما أخرنا وما أنت أعلم به منا ولا تؤاخذنا بما فعل السفهاء منا اللهم لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا واعف عنا واغفر لنا اللهم لا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته